Welcome to this video. This video is the second part of a series, which help you step by step to write your own first plastic unit subroutine. In the first video basics of MISS plasticity were explained. In this video computational plasticity and the algorithm which is used to solve MISS equations is depicted. Necessity and deriving of Jacobian matrix will be discussed in a separate video. In the last video, related UMIT subroutine is described. In this video, at first, essential equations of MISS plasticity are briefly reviewed. Next numerical implementation of the MISS equations is described. Finally, an algorithm to solve these equations is introduced. If you are interested to get ready for writing codes for plastic materials, please keep watching. As was discussed in the first video, MISS criterion is the most common plastic constitutive behavior. At first let's review its relationships. Imagine the most general form of the stress tensor. Hydrostatic pressure is defined as the trace of the stress tensor. Then divitoric stress is calculated by hydrostatic stress. Next the effective stress is defined based on the divitoric stress tensor. In this formula double contracted product of two tensors is used. Similarly, effective plastic strain is defined by plastic strain tensor. The MISS yield function is subtraction of effective stress and flow stress. The flow stress is a function of the effective plastic strain. For linear hardening the flow stress is. We use normality hypothesis to calculate plastic strain increment direction. As the material is incompressible in plastic deformation, trace of the plastic strain tensor is zero. For more details of these equations please watch the first video of this playlist. To numerically solve the presented equations of MISS plasticity, we need to consider that solving of plasticity problems is incremental. So, we use these equations to solve an increment. Imagine we are solving increment number k, we know all the parameters at the beginning of the increment from the end of the previous increment. For example, we know stress and strain tensors at the beginning of the increment. Also the plastic and elastic parts of the strain tensor are known. In nonlinear finite element method, total strain increment is known for the increment. We need to calculate stress and strain at the end of the increment. For this purpose, we need to calculate elastic and plastic parts of the strain increment. The elastic part of the strain plays an important role in calculating the stress. So, at first let's investigate elastic relationships of the material. We assume that the material is linear and isotropic, so, we use Hooke's law to predict elastic behavior. Based on Hooke's law, the stress of the material relates to the elastic strain as follows. Please note that this equation is valid both in the elastic and plastic regions. In this equation C is the elastic stiffness tensor. Stress increment and elastic strain increments can also be related in the same way. Now, imagine that we write the stress and strain as arrays with six components. Please note that this arrangement of shear stresses is based on UMIT subroutine. Similarly using engineering shear strain is based on UMIT subroutine. We can write the elastic stiffness matrix as follows. Where G denotes the shear modulus. Lambda is the Lamis constant and can be expressed based on E and nu. We can also use bulk modulus and write Lamis constant based on bulk modulus and nu. Since in the all diagonal components of the stiffness matrix G exists, we can relate the stress and strain components as follows. For the normal stresses components, we should add this term to the relationship. Where delta ij is Kronecker delta, and is 1 for normal stresses and 0 for shear stresses. Some of the normal strains can be replaced by trace of the strain matrix. Here, I shows first order identity matrix. This equation is valid for any strain, so, we use it at the end of the increment. Now we write elastic strain at the end of the increment based on the strain at the beginning of the increment, total and plastic strain increments. We rewrite the equation by these three terms instead of epsilon k plus 1. As the material is incompressible in plastic deformation, this term is zero. Rearranging the equation gives us
Interestingly, the first part of the equation is equal to the stress in the beginning of the increment plus stiffness matrix multiplied by the total strain increment. In other words, if we assume that the strain increment is totally elastic, we can calculate the stress at the end of the increment by this equation. So, this term is known as elastic predictor or trial stress. The next term considers the plastic part of the strain increment. So, this term is known as plastic corrector. We can write the plastic strain increment based on the normality hypothesis as follows. Now let's show the role of the trial stress and plastic correction in three situations. Imagine that in the beginning of the increment material is elastic. If the trial stress is also elastic, we can conclude that the plastic strain increment is zero and the stress at the end of the increment is equal to the trial stress. If the material is plastic at the beginning of the increment, the trial stress may locate outside the yield surface and plastic corrector brings it to the yield surface. Sometimes material is elastic at the beginning of the increment and trial stress locates outside the yield surface. Here again final stress is located on the yield surface by plastic corrector. To obtain delta P, we need to solve this vector equation which contains six equations for components. Fortunately, we can reduce these series of equations into one equation. At first replace the stress by divisoric stress. Then rewrite the equation based on the divisoric stress. We can replace the right side of the equation by divisoric trial stress. Please note that proving this equality needs some manipulations. The resulted equation relates the divisoric stress and divisoric trial stress. So, it's a useful relationship and we will use it later. Next calculate double contracted product of both sides. Then calculate square root of each side. And finally, just multiply terms in the parenthesis by sigma e, this is an interesting one-dimensional equation which help us to calculate the value of delta p. This is the yield function. Replace the effective stress by trial effective stress. Then, solve this nonlinear equation by Newton's iterative method to find delta p. This term is the yield function and this term is its derivative with respect to delta p, therefore correction of delta p is. By this correction and an iterative loop, we can find delta p. These two equations have another useful result. Just divide both sides of the first equation by relevant sides of the second equation, we obtain which means that flow direction can also be calculated by trial stress. So the plastic strain increment can be written based on the trial divisoric stress. After these manipulations we are ready to introduce an algorithm to solve these equations for an increment. At the start of the increment we know strain, stress, strain increment, and effective plastic strain. At the first step, calculate trial stress or elastic predictor by this formula. Then calculate effective trial stress. Next calculate flow stress based on the effective plastic strain. In the case of linear hardening flows stress can be written as. Next, calculate the yield function by effective trial stress and flow stress. Next check the value of F, if F is negative material is elastic, and plastic strain is zero. Otherwise Newton's iterative method is need to predict delta P or effective plastic strain increment. For this purpose, calculate D delta P by this formula. Then update delta P. Also we need to update flow stress. We repeat these steps until d delta p becomes less than the desired tolerance. After convergence of this loop, we can calculate plastic strain increment. From this point, use the same steps for elastic and plastic cases. After calculating plastic strain increment, we can calculate elastic strain increment. 
Then, calculate stress increment by elastic strain increment. Finally, update variables like stress and effective plastic strain. In the last step, Jacobian matrix is calculated. We will discuss the necessity and the method of calculating Jacobian matrix in a separate video. I hope you have enjoyed this video. Please watch our next videos about deriving Jacobian matrix and writing UMIT subroutine for MISS plasticity. If this video was helpful, please let us know by a like or a comment. Do not forget to subscribe our channel and use more videos about mechanics and simulations.